Okay, welcome to this talk about FPGAs and programmable logic. It's okay if you don't know what an FPGA is, because actually most software engineers don't know about this technology. But I'm going to try to explain to you today what it is and what programmable logic can do for you. But first, let's talk about my favorite subject, which is me. <laughs> I'm Jonas Julian Jensen. I'm from Norway, and this is a picture of my hometown, Tromsø, in the north of Norway, as it probably looks at the moment because it's winter in Norway. I prefer spaces over tabs, preferably two spaces, because look how good this looks. You must agree with me that every code uh, is better with two spaces instead of tabs. Okay. I have a master's degree in FPGA design from the University of Oslo. And this here is my master's thesis. When this thesis was published, it gained a lot of traction because it was on an innovative subject. In, uh, so I got a lot of, lot of uh, pu publicity, pu publicity? <laughs> oh, what is it? in the FPGA community. Uh, so it's about a, a reconfigurable FPGA accelerator for databases. That's the title of the thesis. And, and what, I, what I did was create a PCI Express card which would accelerate the database queries by changing its internal uh, logic for every query. So for every query, you would get, uh, in effect, a custom hardware implementation. And it gained a lot of traction. And I checked last week. It's been cited. It, uh, this is Google Scholar 18 times already. I think that's good for a master thesis. Some of them are also patent claims that cite my thesis. Uh, so it produced a lot of opportunities for me, and I chose to accept a job at Norway's biggest defense company, Kongsberg Defense Systems, and I worked in the missile systems department on this uh, missile right here most of the time, the uh, Joint Strike Missile. It's a cruise missile with anti-ship capabilities. And it's a successful um, uh, system, this one. It has been purchased by, of course, Norway, but also uh, Poland, Germany, Malaysia has them on their ships, the ship launched version. And Japan, I read last, a few weeks ago, they uh, uh, signed the contract for the, the uh, uh, aircraft launched version, probably because of the new tension in the North Korean peninsula. Uh, but most interestingly, uh, interestingly the, United, the United States has purchased this missile and uh, they never purchased foreign weapons because they have so many domestic alternatives. So I think that says something about the quality of this one compared to the competition. But I did also work for civilian projects. This is the remote tower system. So this is a remote controlled aircraft tower. So instead of having a normal air, air traffic control tower on each airport, you would have this camera and sensor package mounted on a tower. And then the air traffic controller can sit anywhere uh, in a data center maybe a thousand miles from the airport, and you can connect to the airport and get up a live feed from the airport. And uh, this is a really big uh, image. It's a 10 times 4K, 360 degree live view. And to uh, stitch together the image and, and uh, transmit it to uh, the uh, control center, we used FPGAs to handle the high amount of data. We also did uh, use FPGAs for uh, for um, uh, pre-processing the image to do motion tracking. So I created an algorithm in C++ that will detect things like drones or unwanted stuff at the airfield, like uh, an animal walks in here, then there will be a box drawn around it here and alert the air traffic controller. So that, this is, these are just examples of what I've done. And this is augmented reality made possible in part by FPGAs. But right now, I'm out of the industry, the defense industry. I'm running this website, vhglwiz.com. And I, I want to create the best website for FPGA and VHGL development. So VHGL is the programming language that you use for this technology. I want to talk about that uh, in a few moments. So at vhglwiz.com, this is the website, and one page. You can find um, free articles, free blog posts, news and a free course, actually, and lots of free tutorials. And I also have a premium training, so you can uh, purchase a premium course and learn the more advanced stuff which I spent years learning. 
Okay, so that's, um, that's what I do now. Um, before we talk about the technology, let's just build up some uh, anticipation, okay? So who uses FPGAs? The defense sector, they use e FPGAs extensively because they have high performance uh, requirements. And uh, they, they don't care about anything but performance. They have unlimited budgets. I've worked in the defense industry. They can, you, you can spend as much money as you want as long as it makes the product better. And that's why they use FPGAs. Uh, FPGAs are also used a lot in space applications like satellites because, um, first of all, they are low power consuming, more so than uh, CPUs and microcontrollers. Uh, uh, and also because they are easier to verify the correctness, uh, it's easier to verify the correctness of a, a hardware implementation, a microchip, than it is to verify the correctness of software. As you all know, it's almost impossible to verify that a computer program is free of errors. And that's also why it's used a lot, it's used a lot in aerospace industry. So uh, it's hard to combine numbers. But one public number is that this aircraft, the A380, Airbus A380, it has at least 700 FPGAs in each aircraft. So it's used a lot in the aerospace industry because they have strict requirements for performance and timing and all of that but also because they are cheaper actually for them to guarantee that it's free of errors. So you can fly and uh, not worry about uh, the plane falling down because of some software error, because it's hardware. <laughs> so it's cheaper for them. It's used in the automotive industry. Um, I know that it's used for uh, controlling diesel engines. That's one example I heard, uh, controlling the, uh, the, uh, how the diesel engines uh, operate and reading sensor data. Telecom industry actually uses lots of FPGAs, not for uh, mobile phones and consumer electronics, but for the infrastructure, like their, their, uh, their, their, their network and, I don't know, satellites. <laughs> I just don't know this image for somewhere. And um, yeah, it's used a lot in, in the telecom industry, even though you don't get it in the consumer hardware. Data centers, all of these names, they have custom FPGA solutions for the, their data centers. So Microsoft Azure, the, the cloud computing uh, solution, they use their own FPGA implementation. And so does Amazon AWS. AWS. Uh, they use it for their web services because it's the only way they can handle this kind of, uh, this amount of data in such a, a short time, so with low latency. And this is what FPGAs are good for. When you can't do it in software, you have to turn to hardware, and FPGAs are where to go. So more exotic uses of FPGAs. There are lots of use cases, but these are just some I picked. High frequency trading. Uh, it's used in uh, high frequency trading because FPGAs have inherently lower latency than software. And making money from the stock market if you're a day trader is all about crunching the numbers as fast as possible. And the, the best way to do this is to use FPGAs uh, because then you can beat the competition if they use computers. So that's why they use it a lot in uh, trading applications. And in the recent few, few years, it, FPGAs have uh, gotten a renaissance. It's being used for cryptocurrency mining. So lots of those Bitcoin mining farms, if they're not using GPUs, they may very well be using FPGAs show you an example of one such card later. Okay, okay, so I talked about who uses FPGAs. But what is it really? So it's okay if you don't know. No shame in that. Most software engineers, even experienced ones, don't know because it's not software, it's hardware, you know? You, should, you don't need to know that. But actually, you should. Let's go and just read the first line from Wikipedia because it's actually a good line, this one. Field programmable gate array is an integrated circuit designed to be configured by a customer or a designer after manufacturing. Hence the term field programmable. So it's an integrated circuit like a microchip, but it can be changed. So when you buy the microchip, you can change it to, to have another content. So what does that mean? 
Well, look, let's have a look at something that's not an FPGA, just to make the distinction. What's an FPGA, what's not? In the semiconductor industry, we refer to everything that's not an FPGA as an ASIC. So if you think of a normal microchip, like what is a microchip, an integrated circuit, and here are some examples, then it's an ASIC because it's an application-specific integrated circuit. It's designed for a specific task, like this uh, Intel CPU, it's an ASIC. It can't become something else. You can't change it to become a GPU or have some other behavior. It will always just be a CPU. And it's unchangeable once it's made and probably mostly digital, like these chips right here, a graphic processor and a microcontroller. Um, the problem with creating ASICs is that it's very costly, it's expensive. It costs perhaps, um, I've heard uh, from one million and up, one million dollars, from when you send the, uh, the drawings to the fab, before you get back the finished chip from the factory, the first chip, you have paid one million dollars. Yeah, that's expensive. And if you made an error, well, that's called a respin in the industry. By the way, bosses, they hate this word, respin because it's so expensive, it costs another million. So th this is okay if you are like uh, producing for high volumes. If you're creating an iPhone for 200 million uh, iPhones, it doesn't matter because one million then is not so much. But for every other application, this is a killer. So you can't use microchips, you can't use ASICs for anything because you don't have the money or the budget for this, it's too expensive. And here comes FPGAs to the rescue. Because FPGAs are microchips like these, which can change their content. So they can assume any other content. They can even become a CPU. They can become a processor. And how do they do this? Let's just have a look inside of the basic building blocks of an FPGA. So FPGAs, most of them, emulate logic gates and digital logic by using static RAM. And this, is, uh, and this is an example just to make you guys understand. So most of you are software engineers. It's a, it's a Boolean expression. If a, uh, uh, a and B, if A and B are true, then Q is true. And this is the uh, symbol in schematics, like in uh, electronics design for this AND gate. This, this, this is an AND gate. And here we see the, tr the uh, <laughs> truth table for an AND gate. So uh, uh, if Q is the output and zero is false and one is true, then the only time that the output is true is when A and B are true. So you've seen this before, it's a truth table. So what if we take this truth table and put it into a small RAM? And I'm talking about a really small RAM, a, a bit level RAM. And this is a... a, a um, uh, so, so how does a RAM work? Well, you put something on the address. You put an address on the address input, and something comes out on the RAM output. And and if we assume that these are the address inputs, we can address four slots because this is a binary input. So let's try now. If we put zero zero, then we are addressing slot number zero. So zero comes out. Okay, so that's the same as the truth table because we have loaded the truth table. If we put some other value, zero and one, then we can read this value and zero comes out of the RAM. And the opposite, uh, still zero comes out of the RAM. And finally, if we address the last slot by using one and one, then we can see the value one comes out of the RAM. So what we are doing here is emulating the AND gate which, in, which is emulating the Boolean expression. So let's just try with an, another example now. This is an OR gate, same, just an OR gate. So it, Q is true if A, is true, is A or B is true. So you've seen this before if you programmed, it's just Q gets the value of the, uh, logi the Boolean expression A or B. This is the uh, schematic symbol for a, um, an OR gate. So here we have loaded the RAM with some new values still the same RAM. Uh, so the only time 
Q is not true is if, if, is, is if uh, uh, A and B are not true, because that's how OR gates, this gates work. So this is simply the truth table of an OR gate. So let's try to put the values on the OR gate. False and false is false. The same with the output from the RAM. False and true is true, and same with the output from the RAM. And the, other, the opposite is also true, same. So you see here, we are putting something on the OR gate here, getting something out. If we put something on the RAM, we get the same thing out, because we loaded the RAM with some values. Uh, and what about the more complex expression? Like uh, Q equals A and B, XOR, C or D. So now we're getting a bit complicated Boolean expression. This is the circuit for such a, a Boolean expression. Well, we just need a bigger RAM. So we can emulate, actually, any kind of, of uh, Boolean expression by using static RAM. That's what the FPGA does. It has loads and loads of static RAM cells, which can be loaded with a, a truth table of, your, uh, of your, your choosing. Like, with your code, we can load this one with custom values. In the FPGA and program logic, these are referred to as lookup tables. So now I'm showing you this is the basic building blocks of most FPGAs. It's a lookup table because we are looking up a value based on the other's inputs. And the output is then our Boolean expression. So uh, these lookup tables are in vast quantities in the FPGA. Usually they are configured in a larger storage container which is called the configurable logic block, or CLB for short. And in this example, they come in pairs. There are two lookup tables in the, uh, these are the RAM-based lookup tables we just saw in the um, uh, CLB. There are pairs of them. And there are also some ex supporting electronics, but this is already becoming a bit technical. So what, you don't need to understand everything of this. I don't expect you. So what I want you to take away from this is that the FPJ can be configured to have any uh, digital logic uh, behavior by changing the, the, the RAM-based lookup tables. And also the routing between these configurable logic blocks can also be changed. So by doing so, by changing the routing inside of here and between these blocks, we can create any digital circuit, even a CPU. So inside of the FPGA, there will be stacks of these um, blocks uh, so the common primitives, like the physical hardware inside of the FPGA chips, are these, the configurable logic blocks with the lookup tables, which we just spent some time talking about. Also, there are some other uh, primitives, like a multiplexer, and that's just a fancy name for a switch, which takes this value or that value and outputs it based on whatever is on the switch. Registers, and these are also called flip-flops. They are for storing values in between clock cycles. So you can create a time-divided uh, uh, um, design. Carry chain logic, and this is for implementing large counters and adders and even fixed-point arithmetics. Block RAM, this is another vital component. So th this was also RAM, I told you. but. You could also have another kind of RAM in the FPGA. In, in, in the silicon chip, you have access to uh, on-chip uh, fast-acting RAM. It's like a CPU cache. And you can use this in your code to store intermediate values. If you want to store like an image while you're manipulating it with your logic, you can store it in block RAM. We'll have a look at this in a moment. More expensive FPGAs have DSP units. Like that for, stands for Digital Signal Processing. It's simply just floating point calculators so that you can use double types or float types in your code. You can do that also in hardware. O other kinds of um, primitives are Ethernet transceivers, gigabit Ethernet transceivers. And they are for transmitting data out of the chip or to another chip or to Ethernet. Or when you, whenever you do that, you should have one of these cores to do that quickly and swiftly. CPU cores, you can actually have um, hard CPUs and hard core the CPUs, they are called. We're going to talk about this in a moment inside of the FPGA. So what, what, what does an FPGA cost? So this is the cheapest one I could find. 
Uh, this is actually the one I have here on this development board. It's the Lattice Ice. It costs five dollar or one hundred fifty one baht at the moment. For uh, volumes, it comes down to four dollars at least. Uh, this is a really small chip. You can see it here. It's just uh, my fingernail here, and there. It's not a bad chip. It's just small. The most expensive one I could find at the moment is this one, the Silings Vertex Ultra Scale Plus. So seventy thousand dollars, two point one million baht for this single chip, uh, it, and it's, it's it's not really big in physical dimensions, but it's uh, about one million times bigger internally than the previous one. So actually, sh you should be robbing electronic supply stores and not jewelries because these things are very valuable, really. So let's have a look inside of the chip. This is the cheaper one, the $5 FPGA, the one that I have here. Inside, there are arrays or um, columns of uh, resources which you can use. So these, which are the most numerous, the blue or whichever color this is, they are the configurable logic blocks with the lookup tables, which you can configure to have any digital logic uh, behavior. And these, these are the block RAM. And these act, act these reddish boxes. And this uh, FJ only has these two kind of things because it's a small, F, cheap FG, FJ. In this, you can store, uh, I think, 32 kilobit of, of stuff. But it, it's, it's in the chip, so it's really close to the other logic here. So this, you can think of like CPU cache. It's really fast on-chip RAM. So this is a small device here. Uh, I found an example of a larger device in 2012, or a bit before that. This FJ was manufactured. This is an, an $8,000 device, which I used in my master's thesis. It donated by a company to me. And it has a bit more stuff. You can see here by the columns there. This is just the same, but there are more stuff inside. It has more real estate, which you can configure and it can probably work at a higher clock speed. But there's one more color here you can see, because the other had two colors. Uh, this one has a reddish color or some other color. That is the DSP unit. So this one has 2,000 floating point calculators, like GPUs stuff. Uh, it's not GPUs, but calculators for, or units for doing floating point arithmetics with doubles or floats. It also has 400,000 logic gates, and that's quite a lot. And 4.6 megabyte of on-chip RAM cache. And this is really uh, fast um, uh, RAM, which is on the chip, which you can use uh, from clock cycle to clock cycle. And impressively not enough, it has 840 IO pins. And you know what that means? You know it has 40, 4, 840 physical pins. And you can use them in whatever way you want, because is an FPGA. So you, can, you can, for example, I'm just guessing now, uh, drive 100 uh, HDMI outputs, or you can uh, interface 200 Ethernet connectors. If you want to make like an Ethernet switch of this chip, you could probably do that, because it has all of the IO pins. And you can do it in parallel, unlike a CPU, which can only do mostly one thing. And as, as we have seen, there are far larger FPGAs today. The newest one I showed you is twice this size. So. OK, so, so we have learned that uh, we can create digital logic inside of the chip. But how, it is, how is it done? If, if, you should, if you wanted to imagine how it was done, if I wanted to imagine how it was done, I would think it was something like this, you know, if I didn't know anything about FEJs, that it's a guy sitting there like me with a, um, a uh, schematic tool and drawing the circuit, you know, that would be a, a fair uh, uh, assumption because we are creating digital logic. But this is not how it's done. <laughs> it's not how it's done. Instead, we describe the circuit that we need by using a text-based computer language. And this is VHDL, the uh, language uh, that I'm an expert in. It's one of two widely used languages. And it's already in the name here, it's HDL, it means hardware description language. But it's really just 
and other programming language with some very special features, which makes it suitable for hardware design. It's a Turing complete language, and that means you can create any program actually with it. Although I wouldn't recommend it for anything other than hardware development, if you don't hate yourself. So sometimes it's referred to as a parallel programming language because it has a high degree of parallelism. Uh, inside of the language, in the language features, there are a notion of threads. I call them threads. Uh, they have another name in VHDL, but just imagine there's a high number of parallel threads which you can create in your programming language. And we have threads in other programming languages. Um, but unlike, for example, in C or Java, the, the threads in the normal programming language, they run independently of each other. And they just run and stop and run and stop or go on different cores on the CPU until they meet the mutex and then they can wait for each other. There's no really no co cooperation between the threads. And even worse, they can behave differently. You know, if you have a multi-threaded program, start it two times, then it can finish differently each time because the threads are just running and being stopped by the CPU scheduler and uh, really not cooperating except for your mutexes. So VHDL also has kind of threads, but they are much more um, um, uh, <laughs> closely coupled. They are waiting for each other and triggering uh, each other. And the behavior of one thread uh, in relation to another is, 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 is very clearly defined. So it has an event-driven behavior. Sometimes VHDL is referred to as an event-driven programming language um, because, of, because the threads have this high, uh, high degree of um, uh, coupling. And to be precise, the threads are 100% predictable. It's not like C or Java. If you run a VHDL program twice or three times, it will always have the same run in the same way. So it's 100% der deterministic threads. And this makes it suitable for creating digital hardware. hardware. Because what you are doing if you are writing this kind of predictable thread which has cause and effect on other threads, you're describing something that can, be, that can be implemented by a digital circuit. And also the, the language can be run in a simulator and we always do that because a microchip, frankly, you cannot see inside of it or it, it's very difficult. If something is wrong with it, it won't print out something, it's just like dark and boring. <laughs> so uh, you have to simulate every design before you run it. And uh, uh, when, we, when you have simulated design and are certain that the design is, is working, you can turn this code into digital hardware. So how does that happen? How does this text code turn into a, uh, something you can program onto the FPGA, like logical hardware? Well, we run it through, through some kind of compiler and a step called synthesis. This is a software tool, a compiler with more. Uh, so what the synthesis tool does is take this code and try to find a logical solution to your problem with the available resources which you have defined. So it takes the code and it creates a, a logical uh, schematic of it. So this, if, if the synthesis is successful, then the, uh, what comes out is a logical netlist which describes your circuit, like the, the drawing I showed you, only created with code instead of drawing the schematics. But this is not the end, because uh, this is a logical netlist, and you cannot just place it on a device, because where do you place it? Then you need to run this uh, output through a new step, which is called place and route. And the place and route tool is also a software tool. It takes the netlist and finds physical placements on the FPJ for your logical components and it creates the routing between the components. Uh, this place and route tool, it has a, um, a good, uh, a, 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 um, a, uh, it has a model of, of your target FPJ, so it's, it's, it's from the FPJ vendor. So it knows where every possible device can be placed on this, on this device 
knows every possible wire, and it takes your code, and it tries to figure out this giant puzzle and create your physical implementation. And what you get in the end is something like this. So this is a, um, a, an example of a fully routed FPGA. This is from a master's thesis. And what I have done here in the thesis is highlight one of, hi highlight one of the clock nets in red. It's a clock uh, signal. And uh, the other blue stuff are just wires. So there are no component, components highlighted here, but they will be under here somewhere. But this is just to give you an idea of what a fully routed FPGA will look like. It has um, wires going from all of the component, components and out of the chip as well. So here are the, are the pins on the peripherals. Fortunately, we don't have to create every possible design from scratch because there are something called soft cores, and I'm talking about uh, code now, nothing else. Okay, so if you need a CPU, for example, in your design, you don't have to create a CPU from scratch. You can actually go to uh, uh, some of the, uh, those who, who have pre-made CPUs. You can download for free a microblaze, I think it's free. Or even an ARM core, if you heard of ARM processors, like they're, they're also used in uh, Arduinos a lot. You can download an ARM core and just place it in your design. I want to have one or two or five processors. You can have it there. You can even run an operating system like Linux. In a, and then you have a soft core CPU. It's not a hard core CPU, it's a soft core because it's in program logic. Other things that are normal to download like this in soft cores, or interface controllers. If you have, for example, if you want to talk to Ethernet, there's no need to like in, uh, uh, go ahead and program the Ethernet interface. You just go and get a soft core which can talk to Ethernet, and then you interface that in your code. So it's, it's like a computer language where you have libraries and also uh, components um, which you can get in, inside of your design like object files or whatever <laughs> you have in software. So if you want to have like an e a USB controller, if you need USB connectivity, you just get the, the interface for it. Same with memory controllers. For example, if you want to talk to external RAM, like in a computer, uh, that, that's called DRAM, dynamic RAM. So like external ra RAM that you have in your computer, you can do that too. Just get the memory controller and uh, start talking to it. And you, can say, you can use it in your code. Other things I could think of is the video processing, for example, or if you need the cryptography course, then you just go and get the soft cores from, uh, you can buy them from uh, suppliers or some, some are for free. So we have some kind of uh, arrangement for uh, sh sharing code and stuff in, or, or s s uh, selling soft components in FPGAs too. Okay, so I'll be talking a lot about FPGAs now. And we're going to continue doing that, but I want to talk about hybrid FPGA CPU solutions. So this is one example of such a chip, a microchip, which I have created some uh, graphics for showing here nicely. This is a Xilinx uh, Zinc 7000 chip. I work with this a lot. It has uh, two parts. It has one part, which is the processing system and other parts, which is the program logic, the FPGA part. So the processing system contains a dual ARM hard CPU core. And I, when I'm talking about hard, about hard core, I'm talking about a CPU that is physically uh, unchangeable. It's like normal CPU in your computer, okay? So it has a normal CPU, which you can use. And in, in the same microchip, you have a program logic part. And the advantage of this is that this interface is on chip, it's on the same chip. So it's super fast. You can never match the speed of this interface because uh, the, um, the interconnect between uh, this part and, and uh, the program logic part, it doesn't have to go outside of the chip. It's still on the same silicon die. So if you want to do, a, for example, ha run an operating system like Linux on the processing part, I've done that uh, many times, then you can send for example, a video stream to the program logic part and process it here with your own codec, for like your own uh, graphics processor. You can create your own graphics processor or 
do whatever you want. If you want to crunch some numbers using the logic, you just send the data over here. Then you retrieve back the uh, results and you display it on the screen or send it over Ethernet or whatever. Or you can use the program lo programmable logic part to uh, interface uh, external signals in high speed because the, the program logic can can sample really fast, like uh, in megahertz range, like 200 megahertz, can sample multiple channels. So if you want to uh, 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 sample a data source at a high speed and display the results on a nice interface thing, then you can run Linux on the CPU and just create your own uh, custom logic for interfacing the external signals. I'm going to show an example of such a, an application later. OK, so it has the benefits of the full running a full uh, operating system, like Linux. You can use the full network stack. You can use all uh, uh, peripherals. So I have a, this is, the, this is the board, the development board for this chip. So we have the uh, audio jacks even here. I think this is uh, Ethernet and HDMI. So if you connect like the normal perif peripherals for your computer, like a keyboard and everything here, then you can run it like a normal computer, and you can still harvest the, um, the power of the program logic part, which is part of this chip. And here are you know, IO pins, which you can use to interface external devices. So it's like, I used to describe this one as the Raspberry Pi on steroids, because Raspberry Pi, it can do this, but it's super slow. And it's nice if you want to log a temperature sensor, but if you want to, want to uh, um, interface some really high bandwidth signals, then this is the way to go. OK, so let's talk about the advantages of CPUs over, of FPGAs over software and CPUs. As you uh, probably know already, it has a higher degree of parallelism because it's custom hardware. You can, um, uh, you can make it as parallel as you want because you are the one designing the hardware. And because of this, it has higher throughput most of the time. Uh, it can process more data at, at each chunk because uh, you, you, you create a hardware. It's not a general machine like a CPU. It does exactly what you want if you, if, if you, if you make it to it. And it has lower latency because normally you don't have to write to external RAM and you don't have to uh, uh, go all the way to the slow dynamic memory interface. And uh, a, a CPU really it does one thing. It runs a program really fast. But the FPGA uh, does it in hardware, so usually it has lower latency, at least predictable latency. Better connectivity, we saw the other chip had 840 I.O. pins, and you can interface like uh, 100 different sensors or Ethernet connections by using this. You can't do that with the CPU. Better timing of I.O. interfaces. So if you want to sample some uh, signal or sensor with a high bandwidth, then you've got to use FPGAs because the CPU is not real time, really. It just does things as fast as it can. And you can't sample the same signal or set the same signal and multiple of them at the same time. It's just not uh, possible with CPUs. Usually, they have a lower power consumption because you can run the design at a lower frequency. And each time you, uh, with a higher frequency, you consume more power because Every time you switch all of the transistors with a higher frequency, it consumes more power. And uh, that's why they use it in space applications uh, also. Easier to prove than that hardware is error free. That probably doesn't matter to you because you use Java anyway, or <laughs> web designers, I guess. But if you, create an, if you create software or hardware for aircraft or space applications, then this matters because you have to prove it's error free almost impossible to prove that a computer program is error-free. You can, but it is expensive. And this one is interesting for you uh, Internet of Things guys. You can, develop, you can push over-the-air hardware upgrades after development. You know, you can uh, issue a um, software update for, f for an Internet of Things application, but with FPGAs you can actually change the hardware as well. And I'm going to show you an example of an iPhone that does this. So what are the disadvantages? Actually, just two things. It's difficult, it's costly. <laughs> Every design must be simulated because you cannot simply look into the chip, not that easily anyway. Not a lot of online resources. Well, I'm changing that now with my website. 
low level design is time consuming. You know, the lower down you go in the stack, it's the more difficult. So you should always use the highest abstraction level. If you can do it with Java, then do it with Python, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's costly because the tools are expensive. You know, a simulator can cost a half a million baht for a, a, a license. There are free ones, but you know, if you want to have the cutting edge. FPGAs can be expensive, and FPGA engineers, they usually have the higher end of the salary. It's the same salary as range as software engineers, but I usually they will be in the upper segment, yeah. Examples of products that use FPJ. So these are some I could dig up from the internet and some I knew about already. The HTC Vive VR headset uses two FPJs. Not sure what to use them for, but I guess that's confidential, but image processing, probably. Google Waymo, this self-driving car of Google, it uses FPJs for uh, uh, doing the image processing. I guess this one produces a lot of data, so you would probably want to stitch together the image. I think it's rotating this camera, I'm not sure. And FPGAs are very good at that. The iPhone 7, and this is kind of an unusual thing to use FPGAs for because uh, mobile phones are produced in such high quantities. It makes sense to create a custom ASIC microchip. But here they actually used it for the AR processing uh, hardware for the camera. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, the AR unit. And uh, my guess is that they, uh, they wanted to ship over the air updates for the, uh, for, for the hardware. Maybe they were not finished with the uh, AR chip and they had to ship the phone. So what did they do? Did we leave it out? No, we just send it and we fix it afterwards. We, so they can send the hardware update just reconfigure the chip while it's at the customer. And that's an uh, ingen ingenious use of FP FPGAs, actually. Send hardware updates over the air. Apple Afterburner, this is a newer graphics processing card somewhere inside of this new fancy computer. It uses FPGAs for doing gra graphics processing. So this is a new card which is capable of uh, rendering and editing uh, so you can edit 8K video in real time. That's what I read anyway. That's a big bunch of pixels at, uh, at a time. And it's a high data rate. So I, I guess that they had to turn to FPGAs because they couldn't find some other solution. NVIDIA G-Sync, this is a smaller thing. So if there are any gamers here, you might have heard of V-Sync, NVIDIA V-Sync. That's the software version where you, where you sync the um, uh, the, the, uh, the screen refresh rate to the output frequency from the, um, uh, from the graphics card. So the, the display doesn't flicker. If you play video games, we might have heard of this. So that consumes CPU. But this is really easy to do in FPGAs. And uh, they used some kind of FPGA here to um, do this inside of the display, actually, to sync the output from the graphics processor to the refresh rate of the screen. Small device, this one, I guess. Uh, this one is um, using the hybrid uh, FPGA solution, which I talked about. This is an, uh, an, an, an uh, oscilloscope. <coughs> Sorry, oscilloscope. So it's uh, it's it's used to uh, sample high um, uh, high frequency signals. Uh, I think this one is 200 megahertz capable, and it looks like it has two channels. So it has to sample um, at least t um, four million data points every second by that rough calculation. But you see here, it's displayed in a nice fashion. So I guess they are using the Linux embed or the embedded Linux running on on the uh, on the uh, CPU part of the hybrid FPJ to sync. And they're using just normal uh, uh, graphics libraries, which you are familiar with already. And uh, they're doing the heavy lifting and uh, the data sampling by using the FPGA part. So that's something you could do. I, I guess one this could also connect to the internet somehow. Mm, no. Well, if it could, it would be Internet of Things. And that's a prime example of a high performance Internet of Things application. Uh, ultra minor FPGA, uh, this one is, I just found it on the internet, it's an Indiegogo project. But this is an example of one of those Bitcoin mining uh, rig uh, cards. So 
So it's not very um, in oh, sorry, it's not very interesting this uh, from an FPGA point of view, but it's still something it's used a lot for. Okay, so the pebble time. I don't know why they used the FPGA here, but because they didn't have to, it's slow moving. <laughs> But if you had this early smartwatch, you have actually been walking around with an FPGA on your wrist the whole time. Yeah, if you want to know more about FPGAs and even try coding in VSGL, the, the language, you can go to uh, uh, take my free um, uh, 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 course, my basic VSGL course, and I use a free uh, the, the, um, the, the free version of the most popular VHL simulator because you can get an educational license, anybody can do it and everything is free so you can go and check out and try out VHL in your simulator without purchasing hardware if you're more interested you can take my paid course and learn how to do all of this so later uh, after the break I'm going to do a demo on this car and I'm going to program some VHL and see if we can get some life, life into this thing